Bam! Everybody, I'm Stefan Adiga, your host. This is Talking Wax, and this is our new playlist, Artist Rewind, the ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. And also, please, if you do like tonight's show or any past shows and you want to get more unedited content, get out all access VIP backstage pass. That'll unlock those episodes for you. And plus, on the first Saturday of every month, if you're part of the Talking Wax tier and Patreon, well, we do vinyl games. You get to bring your records, you get to challenge somebody, and also you get to walk away with some free records courtesy of us. Now, coming up next, we're one of the most legendary bass players in heavy metal. Played with Dio, played with Black Sabbath, played with Ozzy Osbourne, played with Uriah Heep, played with Gary Moore. We have Mr. Bob Daisley coming up here. That's right, the man himself. Also, he's bringing a friend, Mr. Eric Singer of Kiss. Well, Bob and Eric go way back. They both played in Gary Moore's band. That might have been the, one of the reasons why he's in one of the world's greatest rock band, rock and roll bands out now. Okay, but moving forward, let's go see what those guys are talking about. The banter, the laughter, the stories. That's all coming up next on Talking Wax Artists Rewind. And don't forget to subscribe, everybody. All righty, here we go. Roll it. Bam. Oh, there comes Eric right in time. I think he's coming. There hey, he Eric. is. Hold on. He's right here. Look at this. Uh, Eric? James. What's up, Seven? Sorry, I was on another call and I didn't, couldn't get, let me turn, the, let me turn off the stereo. Turn okay. Off the music. We got hey, we, Eric. Is Eric? Bob on video or just well, audio? Well, hold on. This is a special. This is special right now. This is, this is, you got on the cover. Bob, <laughs> got, Bob, Bob, I'm sorry you're dealing with an idiot, but I apologize. I just came on uh, to save you. Bob, I, you know what? I needed a good co-host. I wanted to surprise you this evening. So we got, as my co-host, everybody, we got the wonderful hey, Eric. Eric Singer, and we got the fabulous Bob Daisley right here. I'm not Alrighty. your co-host. You're my co-host. No, I'm your manager. Well, you're my manager also. <laughs> well, my Bob, manager. Bob, we have it reversed because he's the Jew. And I'm the one that's being the manager. It should be the other way around. <laughs> you, you know what? You, you know what? Every show needs something. You know what? I have an intro. I'm going to play the intro. Then we're going to right into it. Ready? And here it goes. All righty, Eric. Be professional. Okay. All right. Ready? One, right. two, three. Here it goes. Bam. Chuck and wax. Uh -huh. everybody welcome tonight's episode it's gonna be a fabulous one we got the, the legendary the wonderful mr bob daisley now bob played with everybody from uriah heat black sabbath ozzy osborne dio i mean Ingve, the list goes on we're going to talk about everything with bob and then we also have right here the fabulous my manager mr eric singer uh, eric welcome <laughs> welcome to the show well, welcome to bob <laughs> yeah. bob you know the name of, bob you know the name of the company right dch dewey cheatham and how <laughs> that sounds like something out of the three stooges that's well, well, exactly where it's from you're, that's, that's, oh, okay there you go you're you're at different times um, you're in australia right Not right now that's i'm in sydney you're... australia sydney, now yeah. australia. okay so how's yeah. the weather down there how's how's everything well we're, we're in the tail end of winter um <clears throat> and it, you know well, the winter isn't harsh here in sydney but there are parts of australia where you can ski and it snows and it gets very cold in the mountains and and that sort of thing probably similar to um los angeles and parts of california you know where you get sunny weather and a mild winter but you can also go skiing in the mountains so it's yeah it's a bit like that but uh, to be honest with you I prefer a proper winter, and I, I, I miss the UK um, definite seasons. You know the seasonal changes and contrast, but you know it gets it gets a, it can be a bit samey, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, when it's, uh, mm -hmm. Bob, I miss the weather too. Like I grew up in Cleveland, obviously, where we had. The only problem is some of those areas the winter is just too long, so you get tired of it when it gets too cold for so long. So I yes, like I know. I dread the summer every year here because it's too hot and it's too humid, and I really don't like that. It's just uncomfortable. It, Bob, Bob, how was the weather year seasonally when you were in in uh, Brighton? Because you used to live on the on the ocean, you know. Yeah, we yeah, Brighton. yeah, we're just just right near the coast road that ran along the, the seafront, and um, 
it, it was nice, you know. But, but people tend to think that that um, you know because it's England. Oh, you don't have summer. Yeah, we had summer, and it was wonderfully warm and sunny, and and people at the beach, and it was great. But you got the definite seasonal changes, you know, autumn where all the the leaves change color, and you buy win new winter clothes, and then Christmas, you know, frosty windows, open fire, and everybody in overcoats and scarves and all that it was great. I, I love I, it. That's what I miss. I, you know, Bob, it's funny you say that. It, the, the fashion with the seasons, it's such a great thing. Now everybody's looking like they're, they're, they're dressed with their open toe shoes. And they're, they're, that's not good. It's not good. There's no, there's no more style. Like, Eric, look at you. You got the hat. You look nice. You dress British. You think Yiddish. I like it. That's it, Bob. <laughs> right, Bob? Dress British. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I've got some great pictures of you, Eric, on the road with Gary and that, sir. And you look a million bucks. <laughs> oh, you do, oh, yeah. huh? Not like, really. I like Bob, I have to tell you, I remember, remember when Steve Barnett, who was managing Garrett Town, I remember he pulled me aside one time and was trying to get me to cut my hair and asked me if I would, you know, cut my hair, if I would dress differently because he didn't want me dressing the way I was dressing because it was obviously 1987 and I was from yeah. living in L.A. and I was looking more like an L.A. band kind of a guy being from America being the, and I was the lone septic on the whole tour, as you guys would call it. <laughs> septic tank yank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and there you go. And I was the only one that I, re, I remember Steve Barnett saying to me one time, and I kind of just, I don't remember what I said to him. It was kind of like, it was almost like, well, I was nice about it. But it was almost like, like, what's the big deal? I mean, it's like, whatever. But well, 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 Bob, tell me the, the timeline with the Gary, with Gary Moore was what well, Bob, you were in Gary Moore when Eric first joined or what's the whole Yeah, thing? I kind of got Eric. I was my suggestion to get Eric because Eric and I, the year before had worked on the Black Sabbath album, The Eternal Idol. So I knew Eric personally and, and I knew his playing and that. And we'd been auditioning a lot of drummers in, uh, in London. And I said to Gary, get Eric Singer over. He's, he'd be perfect. And uh, it, it, it came down to between Eric and Zach Starkey, who was Ringo's son. Oh, wow. Who was also a good drummer. And he ended up in working with Pete Townsend and The Who and that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, at the time... The only thing going against Zach, he, he's, he was a little inexperienced. He was still sort of kind of climbing the ladder and, and getting experience. And, and, and he, he was a good player, but, but Gary was a little, a little bit sort of, you know, concerned about his lack of experience and being young. And, and he, he hadn't reached his sort of uh, playing peak at that point, but he was, he was good. Yeah. And he went on to be even better, and that, you know. But, but yeah. Eric was perfect for the band. So right. well, that was it. Eric was in, and he won the race. <laughs> well, won the remember, race. I remember Bob called me up. He said, "Hey, Eric, Gary needs a drummer. He's auditioned a bunch of guys. He hasn't found anybody that he's happy with. I told him about you. You should do this. It will be good for your career because Gary's so respected." So I flew over and I auditioned, and then after that, they said, "Okay, well, there's some guy that Gary." Audition. I remember the manager called me and said, "There's a guy that they auditioned in the beginning. They just want to check him out uh, again. And can you learn these other songs?" And so I had to learn a couple more songs with no drum kit, just with drumsticks on my leg in the hotel room the night before. Right. I went back the next day and played again. And then they right. said, "Okay, you got the gig." And then um, I literally flew home and started preparing for. Uh, to fly back a few weeks later and we started rehearsing at John Henry studios in London. And you remember Bob, we, and the, Bob would leave early. I remember this Bob and Neil Carter had to catch the last train to go home to Brighton every day. So, and Gary, as you know, would love to play. So sometimes Gary and I would stay and jam just guitar and drums after Bob and Neil left and just would jam on. I remember we jammed thin Lizzy riffs and other kinds of riffs. Wow. Wow. All oh, right. Okay. Great. So that, yeah, that was 87, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Wow. And then I remember um, after that, you know, we started doing Badlands and Bob went back to play with Gary again. And then I, I was on tour with Paul Stanley. I came home. This is no answer machines, no internet then. Mm -hmm. And there was a message right. on my voice. And I said, 
Eric, this is Gary. Um, I need, I, I need a drummer or something to that effect. And by the time I called him back, Bob said that you had told him, Hey Gary, why don't you just get Eric back since cozy Paul didn't work out for some reason. And That's then, right. by, then, by then you guys had already hired, um, Chris Slade. Chris Slade. Chris Slade. Yeah. But I yeah. did remember, I felt kind of somewhat in a way good that Gary at least considered me because he, I remember he left me a voicemail, Bob. And right. But, okay. And, uh, but I had no way of getting the message because I was out of town and I was on right. tour with Paul Stanley doing his solo. Tour right. At that point. So, yeah, I knew Cozy wasn't going to work work out. I mean, that that whole story is in my book, but but it's um it's one of those things where I just I said to Gary at the beginning of the week when we started rehearsing with Cozy, I phoned Gary and I said, you know, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I got a bit, bit sort of concerned about if this is going to work out. He said, Oh no, it's all right. It's it's early days. It, it'll be fine. And then by the end of that week, Gary was phoning me and he's saying, actually, I think you're right. And so, uh, yeah, Cozy didn't work out. And then we got Chris Slade. But I didn't even know that uh, I told him to, but I didn't know that Gary had actually phoned you and left you a message. But I, I didn't know that. But Chris Slade was great. He worked out and, and yeah. did the job. Well, well you told fine. me, Bob, at the time, because my memory is pretty good like yours as well. You said that yeah. you told him, why don't you just call Eric back? He said, listen to the tapes. From the last tour, just you know, and I don't know what happened with Cozy with if he what didn't want to take direction from Gary because as we know, Gary liked to tell you how to play, and if he want if he wanted something specific, he would tell you. And some people maybe don't want to be told how to play. I I'm always been cool about it. To me, I'm always figured I'm there to make the to get the job done and make the person happy. Um, I don't know if maybe Cozy didn't want to take his direction. I have no idea. That, that was kind of the situation. You know, Co Cozy wanted to be more loose and do what he wanted to do. And Gary said, no, I want it like this. I want this played. I don't want that played. It was a bit like that. And I could see them getting up each other's noses. And I, and I knew after the first day it wasn't going to work out. And, that, and that's why. Yeah. Yeah, but it worked out. It worked out, but, but but because of my meeting Bob with the Black Sabbath situation, you know, they wanted Bob to be in Black Sabbath. They offered him the gig, and Bob at first was going to do it, but then I think he realized it was very in disarray. They had switched management, and things were just upside down. And Bob realized, you know, I think you re realized that eh, it's probably not the right thing to do. And thankfully, Bob took me along with him and saved me. Let me ask you both yeah, guys. I was considering the Black Sabbath thing, but I was pretty happy working with Gary because I was working with Gary at the time. Right. Get, but, get, but Gary was and the tough. Management, I, and, and that sort of situation with Sabbath wasn't very stable and, and it was kind of you know, a bit, bit shaky and a bit sort of, um, you know, not ideal. So um, I stayed with Gary and then, uh, and then you ended up with me with Gary anyway. Right. That's, so Gary was pretty tough, huh, to, to work with, like, you know, as a, he knew what he wanted to hear. Would he... Not tough, but, but, but sort of um, quite uh, strong minded. He knew what he wanted and what he didn't want. And he was quite particular. And it was a bit like, um, I suppose, similar to Richie Blackmore was like that. You know, he, he knew what he wanted and, and it had to be that way. Hmm. He was uh, particular is the best word. I agree with you, Bob. He, because he would tell me to play things a certain way. And um, the, I remember that particular album that we were touring from uh, Wild Frontier was all done with a program drum machine parts. So some of yes. that stuff that wasn't a real drummer and you almost needed an extra arm sometimes to play certain little parts of it. <laughs> yeah, because something the drum machine could do that, that, that wasn't really human. I hated that era, to be honest. I really didn't like program drums. I mean, give me a real drummer any day. And I remember in particular the song Wild Frontier. Um, not, I'm sorry, not Wild Frontier. Um, Over the Hills and Far Away, which is in 6-8, like a triplet feel. Gary wanted yes. those verses played all one-handed, and it was hard to play it up-tempo because Gary would play it 
uh, we we had we didn't have a click track. We had a there was a couple breakdown sections where we used samples. So I had to yes. start the song in the correct tempo, and I would use a yeah. metronome like to start it, so we wouldn't get off the mark. But it was tough to play that all in one hand. So I would play it with two hands, cheating it. And Gary would say, "I want you to play it with one hand. It doesn't sound right." I'd be like, "Okay." And some nights it'd be hard to play it. So I would play two hands. He turned around and look at me, Bob, and I would turn around and go switch to one hand so he wouldn't catch me. <laughs> and um, because he wanted it. Oh, he wanted to. Yeah, that. yeah. Oh, Gary had Bob. very. That's the thing with Gary. He couldn't put anything over him. He had very yeah. sharp ears. Bob, you know, my he... favorite story about Gary was, well, there's a couple funny ones, but the one I remember in particular. You know how Gary would sometimes, if he was feeling it. He would decide, like, I'm going to really jam on this section. Um, one night we did a version of The Loner, which was the, usually would be the final encore. One time I think it was either 27 or 29-minute version of the song. Oh, I know. The intro alone was like a whole song. was like three or four minutes and then you get into the meat of the song and then and then the outro would go on and on and on yeah. and we knew we had to travel overnight after the show and we'd be all looking at our watches and looking at each other and come on gary for fuck's yeah. sake <laughs> but, some, but 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 sometimes you know depending how we would feel it which is great he he was as bob will tell you he was a great improviser he'd never run out of ideas he could solo and solo and solo in any style endlessly which was fantastic oh, and and the thing is you know in that band bob was always the anchor it's not the drummer bob the, the bass player was the anchor in gary's band clearly and um sometimes gary would jam and go on and on and so sometimes when you know i was brought up playing with my dad where my dad would say always listen to the soloist and if he's playing figures you should catch those figures and follow him and and usually guys that jam that are really prolific in that way, they kind of usually appreciate when the band listens to them and does some of yeah. that. I remember one time I did some lick and Gary turns around and he goes, fuck off. And he, because <laughs> I was overplaying. And the thing is, Gary wanted you to have a certain amount of ability, but he didn't want you to necessarily use it. And yes, um, yes. So he told me to fuck off and I'll never forget that. It reminded me of me getting yelled at by my dad as a kid. <laughs> and I, I, I felt like I, Bob, I felt like I wanted to shrink down behind the drums, but I thought, you know, you got to learn how to take the good with the bad. And um, Well, that's right. That's right. And when you get a fuck off from Gary, it's <laughs> not that I ever had one, but I can imagine what that would be like because, um, you know, he, Gary was just so good. He was just such a great yeah. player and a great yeah. musician, and he yeah. was – so well respected and respected and rightfully so. Yeah. Well, Bob, I, I, one thing I noticed, he never that I ever saw had one problem or issue with you, but you could do no wrong. That's why I said you were truly the real anchor of the band. And, you know, when they say a bass, you know, the word bass as a guitar is B-A-S-S, -S, but the word bass, B-A-S-E, is usually referred to as a foundation of a building. Yes. And yes. it really yeah. is a foundational instrument. And I always look at it like the bass is the one that kind of holds it together, in my opinion. Right, right. I, I got to ask Bob right now, because yeah. you're, as bass plays go, you're, you're up there. You're pretty much the, the best of the best. Bob, yeah. the, you know, I would say Eric, right? Yeah, Bob's you know? is good. Well, Bob's my favorite bass player that I ever got. You always say this to me. I always all say the that time. to everybody. Yeah. But that's really nice to know, and it's a, it's a compliment, you know. But and I don't take thing. that lightly, and I, and I and I don't really take it for granted either. You know, that's that's a really nice thing to have said. Thank you. Seven, well, Bob, on top of being a songwriter, Bob's, good, Bob's as good as it gets. It really, yeah. it really is. He's, he's, it's as good as it gets. But the main thing about Bob, aside from just being all the fundamentals have always been there. He's so fundamentally sound, meaning, you know, playing all the right parts, but it's really the creative parts that he writes that makes, that puts him in his own league. You know, he's like, a, he was always like a hard rock, heavy metal Paul McCartney, if you will. You mm -hmm. know, he's got the elements. He's, everybody makes their own soup of whatever their style is. And Bob always had all the right ingredients of Jack Bruce, John Paul Jones, 
and you know Paul McCartney, all those great players, but yet he had his own thing. But he had his own thing. His own sound. Yeah, he took a little bit of everything. He made his own soup. Really, it, it, it is. You made your own well, that's if part. I'm ever asked by by people that are learning and you know up and coming young students and, and that, I, I I always say it's good to have a hero and try to sound like them, it, or or more than one sort of influence, you know, because eventually your own thing comes out through that anyway. You know, like when I was very young, I wanted to sound like Paul McCartney. Then I wanted to sound like Jack Bruce. And then I listened to Ronnie Wood playing bass with Jeff Beck on those early Jeff Beck albums. And, um, you know, and then the James Jameson thing with the Motown stuff, you know. And eventually it, it did. It went into a, like a melting pot. And, and my thing came through in that, you know. Absolutely. You know, it's funny that you always mention Ronnie Wood. That's Gene Simmons' favorite bass player when he was younger. Most influential was Ronnie Wood on those Jeff Beck records. He always says, it's "Yeah, that. Truth and Beck Ola, they're great albums, and and great you know, I, I think they're as important and and just as good as a lot of the early Zeppelin albums. You know, and they're uh, they're kind of like <laughs> the first one. Truth is is like the first Led Zeppelin album before Led Zeppelin. So oh, yeah. you know, and Ronnie Wood played bass with. It was really, really. He he had dexterity and he had taste and style and a really aggressive sound and it was just lovely stuff. It, it really he really knew where to put the parts in and fill it up in the oh, right yeah. spots. It just very yeah. just a taste. That's he knew he knew what to put in the soup on that one. Bless my soul, what's wrong with me? Okay, now it's me and Bob. Bob, let's talk for a second. Is it oh, up? Yeah. How are you going? One, two, three, four. Bob, we figured it out. What is it? It's it's Eric. Yeah, Eric, okay. Look, listen to us. Yeah, it's fine. It's not it's doing it. anything. It's not doing it. It's the are your teeth rattling, Eric. <laughs> he just signed off. He'll come back on. This and we're having a good conversation. <laughs> I see, Bob, this is turning into a really good interview. But then he, yeah. has, <laughs> he has to mess it up and put it the blame on the host. Okay, yeah. here he here he's back. I bet you Zach Starkey has better internet than this. He probably okay. is better. Zach Starkey okay. is probably way better. Has probably a better phone and more money because he's got his dad's money. It's your, it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know. Sometimes I see those old film clips of of Ringo and Maureen. That was his wife at the time. With with uh, Zach is a is a little tiny baby thing, you know. And I I can't. I, I've actually said out loud. I auditioned that baby once. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it just sounded funny. It just felt funny, you know. It, it, he definitely <laughs> became a fine drummer. He went from Oasis to Who. I mean, he did a lot of great, great stuff. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look at his dad. His dad, I think, is is one of the drum heroes of all time. He's just so tasteful, and he has got such a great feel. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, his 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 choice, his choice of you know what he does was just perfect for the Beatles. You know, they would not have been the Beatles without Ringo. No. Perfect no. hearts. You're right. Perfect. I got to meet Lee sitting with me, and that was a pretty big thing, you know, at the time. And, what, a, uh, what a lovely guy, huh? Really, really was a sweet guy. Who's you this? Know, you know, Lee Kerslake. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Lee was a lovely bloke, Re really down to earth, proper, you know, salt of the earth sort of chap. And Uriah Heep, you were with Lee and Uriah Heep, and uh, how, yeah. did you, how, how did you guys make, meet anyway in the first place? Did you know beforehand Lee or what? What's well, Lee, I, I met Lee when I was in Widowmaker, and he was still in Uriah Heep, uh -huh. and that would have been about, I think, like early '76. Um, we we did a few shows with Uriah Heep from time to time, and that they were a great band, Uriah Heep, you know. But yeah, but it was later that um, Lee and I began to work with the Blizzard of Oz with Randy Rhodes and and Ozzy, and it was after we did those two albums, the Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Man. Well, wow. man, that Lee and I reformed Uriah Heep with Mickey Box. And then we got Pete Goldby on vocals and John Sinclair on keyboards. And that, that was another good version of, of Uriah yeah. Heap, you know, with um, 
it was um, very enjoyable, and it was uh, you know there were no sort of leaders or bosses or or that sort of thing. You know, it was just a band playing music and having fun together. It was it was very enjoyable. You know, Mickey Box is a lovely bloke. Lee was lovely bloke. You know, and they're all good guys, and and we had we had a blast doing that. You know, I I ended up going back to Aussie in '83. Uh, originally, it was just to um, write the next album, which ended up being Bark at the Moon. But then he asked me to join permanently. And uh, it was because, that, yet again, a management record company thing with Uriah Heap, they just weren't doing the job. Uh, I found out many years later that the first album that we did, Abominog, with that lineup, um, it was uh, David Geffen, loved it, loved the album and wanted to release it through Geffen Records in America, which would have been huge. I mean, he had so many big hit acts and big name acts on, on that label. John Lennon was one of them, you know. Wow. And this wow. is in and this is in 83. Anyway, I didn't know, we, we didn't know at the time. We found out later that David Geffen got in touch with Jerry Bron, who was the um management record company of of uriah heap and he said i'd, I'd like to release a bombing through geffen records in america and apparently jerry Brown said to him well yeah okay but you've got to take girl school and motorhead as well and david geffen he, he just said no he flat and he refused no i don't want them i just want uriah heap so jerry Brown said well okay no deal then so we missed wow. out on that and i mean that would have been huge yeah, would have been huge. Very, huge. very, very, very disappointing. Wow. Was Geffen, that's right. I think, would the Geffen start, was Lennon's record one of the first records that, on Geffen? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. Double Fantasy. Double Fantasy. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep, yep, yep. Stephen, you remember that, Abominog, because they, they had an MTV song, that's the way, because that's the way that it is. That was that's a, right, the MTV were playing that, that we had a video to go with that, and they were playing it on it, yeah. That was a big yeah. TV hit for uh, for right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean that that whole album. People love that album. Yeah. But it just didn't get the push and support and promotion that it really deserved and that it needed. Wow. So you know, if it was on an Amer proper American label, Bob, at that time with MTV. Like you said, Geffen or something, mm -hmm. it would have it would have been way bigger. There's no doubt. Oh sure, Geffen. absolutely. The, yeah. Look what they did. Look what they did for White Snake. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, he had a lot of big names on his label, David Geffen, and they were all huge. Yeah, yeah. they were hot. He knew what he was doing. Hot. Yeah, he, 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 he knew what he was doing. Stop right there. I know what you're thinking. That's it. Is there more? Yeah, there is more. We'll meet you here next week, same time, same channel, and we'll hear more from Bob and Eric on their career and a lot, lot more. Until then, everybody, I'll see you then. Now, get out of here, you crazy kids. I love you. To be continued. Mwah. Bam! <laughs>Stop right there, everybody. If you did like this episode and you want to see more episodes like this, I need you to do one thing. You're probably going to see a little thing maybe over here, maybe something over there. Click on it. Share it out with your friends. Hey, it's only rock and roll, everybody, and we like it. Until then, we'll see you later. Who loves you, baby? We do. Bam!